Listener Production. Hi, I'm Sasha Barbagat. Welcome to this episode of The Briefing. Athletes are held to extremely high standards, especially when heading overseas for the Olympics. But what about athletes that come from countries run by dictators? Do different rules apply on top of the usual expectations of being in peak mental and physical fitness? North Korea has chosen once again to send its athletes to the Olympics, and they've caused a bit of a stir in Paris. They've been filmed waving and smiling at TV cameras, cheering on athletes from the USA, and even posing for selfies with competitors from South Korea. Some observers have even wondered if this is a sign of a softening North Korea, looking to open up more to the world after a long, long period of extreme isolation. So is what we're seeing in Paris a signal of a more global Korea or a clever PR move by the dictatorship? And what expectations are put on the country's athletes when they're sent off to be ambassadors for such a highly controversial regime? Joining me now to discuss those ideas is Professor Rold Malianke. He's a professor in Korean studies and deputy director of the Korea Institute at the Australian National University. Professor, welcome to The Briefing. First off, why does North Korea send athletes to the Olympics when it doesn't even air them to the general population? It is indeed a good question because there is very little engagement, as we've seen, as you know, between the athletes and other parties. There's been very pleasant interactions with Chinese players and and as we know with a few South Korean players. But beyond that, there isn't much interaction. And so... The question remains, why would they indeed send their athletes to the Olympics when they're not reported on much in North Korea? And and I guess uh, the quick answer to that is simply to remain engaged with the international community. And that engagement does not go very far at present. I assume that it's a bit of a trial run. As you know, they haven't been to the Olympics for quite a while. It's been about eight years And to come now at a time of great security concerns, both for us perhaps uh, as well as for them, their participation is very much driven, I think, by a desire to, to trial their participation and see what they can learn from the experience and perhaps use it domestically. Have we seen those friendly interactions before? I know we haven't seen North Korea at an Olympics for eight years, but have we seen these friendly interactions, not only interacting with the South Korean journalists, but they were cheering on Simone Biles, they were waving at the cameras. Felt very strange to see North Korean representatives being so openly friendly. Yeah, we have seen it before uh, towards South Korean athletes, but this is the first time I've seen a North Korean athlete being so happy for, in this case, yes, Simone Biles. At the same time, I'm sure that they will enjoy very much the individuals seeing the, the, the absolute kind of wonderful accomplishments of people in their own fields. I think that's absolutely genuine. I don't think we can politicize that too much. But at the same time, I think they will be very careful not to cheer for, for example, a Japanese uh, accomplishment. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I noticed reading the Chosun Shinbo uh, recently on the 31st uh, of last month, the Chosun Shinbo is like the Korea report. It made quite a lot of hoo-ha about the ultimate uh, winners of the uh, match against the Japanese, two kind of mixed doubles uh, being so kind of unexpected in their win, um, and that the uh, what is it, Harimoto and Hayata being actually ranked second. And I, I thought first, before I saw that they were actually ranked second, that they kind of made too much of the win of the victory but they were indeed uh, ranked second when I checked. And so I I guess even that victory, even though that victory was one of the few things that was reported on, um, was obviously politicized. It was a genuine win and they were up against uh, two very formidable players. Look, I'm curious to know what 
training or guidance the North Korean athletes are given before they leave. Obviously, you can't just walk out of North Korea. This would be a heavily monitored and state-sanctioned event. What sort of preparations do they undergo before they head off to Paris? I think we can uh, compare North Korea's athletes with K-pop idols from South Korea in that they're incredibly well trained in how to behave overseas because they do travel overseas fairly regularly, maybe not always as far as, but they do travel. And so I guess there will have been a reminder of repercussions, if you will, but they are, I think, already very much aware of the things they can do and what things they should be very wary of. And so I think when they engage with other athletes within their own sport, I think they, uh, as long as these people are not Japanese, I think they uh, are quite free to express excitement uh, and support. But beyond that, I think they'll be very careful, like most North Koreans when they travel abroad. And I think the athletes in particular are very, let's say, safe bets for the North Korean regime because of all that training they've undergone for years. How closely monitored are they once they're somewhere like Paris? I think they're very closely monitored. So there will be trainers there, but the, uh, some of the trainers may not actually do much training. They're probably just uh, people working for the government to ensure that whatever is going on is kind of scrutinized, reported on as well, and perhaps um, in a sense tallied, if you like. So they'll report to the athletes as well at the end of the day about things that perhaps they could have done better, um, things they have to be careful with, um, and maybe sometimes they're given a compliment on how they dealt with uh, tricky situations because, of course, not, a lot of things cannot be predicted. Mm. It's quite common for North Korean, let's say, support people to actually be working for the government when they say they're um, trainers or serving some other function. And so I, I assume that at least a number of the support people are simply government uh, security people. What about when they get back? What are the athletes allowed to talk about with their loved ones, their family, their friends? You know, I can imagine going from North Korea to somewhere like Paris would be quite an assault on the senses for someone who's grown up and raised and lives in North Korea. So what are they allowed to say when they get back home? Overall, the usual procedure with these kinds of international engagement is that they will be monitored quite closely and debriefed. And so they are not supposed to mention sensitive issues. I'm sure that when they get home, they can talk about, you know, how hard it was or how happy they were, et cetera, et cetera, but nothing political. And so then if they did well and if they behave, let's say, then the, um, and I, I guess I, I like to think of them as a cartel, the cartel may reward them with things. Now, they won some silver medals, which is wonderful. And it's been said that perhaps that may translate into uh, kind of major gifts like uh, a better house and so on. But I'm, I'm not sure whether that's going to be uh, true. Uh, no one, I think, really knows. And they may get some privileges, perhaps their children later on or other relatives may be given some extra privileges. But whether it translates into something as perhaps tangible as a house or a car. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced. Look, before we let you go, Professor, I mean, there has been talk and we've kind of skated around it a little bit in this conversation that these displays of openness that we've witnessed from the North Korean athletes at this Olympics could be a sign of North Korea softening even just a little bit. Do you think that's true or do you think that's optimistic? I think it's a little optimistic. At the moment, what I've seen so far in the coverage is that North Korea is behaving very carefully indeed, and so are the athletes. I think the only uh, very positive thing I have noticed is the Chinese coverage of the North Korean players. They've been very fond of the North Korean kind of engagements. And so in a sense, the only real positive that comes out of this for North Korea as a whole, as opposed to the individual athletes, is I guess a certain fandom, if you like, among Chinese viewers of the Olympics. 
There was an interesting report that's been shared quite widely on Kuaishou, the Chinese TikTok. It is a video of someone buying 16 pairs of high quality trainers at a regular shop in Beijing for North Korea. And the fact that someone would have to go to China, to Beijing, to buy some proper trainers for Olympic athletes is quite something, of course. And, and so the Chinese uh, viewers shared this with a sense of perhaps fondness uh, for the simplicity of things and the fact that, you know, the North Korean athletes have to do with much less than most others get in their preparations. Mm. I think that is probably only the real kind of international positive general outcome. The rest, I think, still remains something of a trial. That was Professor Roald Malianke from ANU's Korea Institute speaking with me there. And that is all for this episode, but we will be back tomorrow with another excellent weekend briefing ep with Helen Smith talking to Amy Shark. Here's a little sneak peek. I'll tell you the first time I ever got close to a Kardashian that had nothing to do with Blink was the very first late night show I played was James Corden. Yep. And Kim was on the same night as me. And I don't know if you remember what he does in in that show, but you do the door open of who's up next. So Kim opens her door, which was next to me, and she's wearing this beautiful, like, slinky number. And I'm literally in black jeans and a white T-shirt. And so we do that. And then I joked around and said, I feel very underdressed. And then she yelled out, you look great, babe. And a reminder, we put out full apps of our weekend briefing chats on YouTube. Search Listener Newsroom to see them. I'm Sasha Barbagat. We'll catch you next time. Hold up. 